you near me and you're outside, come on in because we're going to get started and we have an amazing day ahead of us here. Uh, lots to get through, um, but we want to kick off uh, this great uh, Friday morning with some very special awards and uh, historically uh, we have uh, done these kind of all at once at our, our bank but, but we wanted to spread them out um, throughout the weekend here so everyone could have their special moment and I'm going to kick it off with our uh, 2022 fundraising award. Um, I'm uh, so excited um, to award our 2022 fundraising award uh, to Kimber Hylene. Um, Kimber is an amazing mom of Lila, who is seven years old with MPS6. And uh, I don't know if, if any of you um, follow Kimber on Instagram. She has a really great Instagram page. It's um, Kimber Hylene, and it's spelled a little bit different, I think. It's how it sounds, right? H-I-G-H-L-I-N-G is her Instagram, so look her up. Write that down. Uh, because uh, she makes some amazing uh, awareness um, videos um, with her daughter and all of her kids, and, and I love, uh, love watching those. And Kimber, over the last couple years, along with her family, have really introduced the MPS community through their lemonade stands and their Easter egg hunts. They are very creative with all of their fundraising events and really the uniqueness of her lemonade stands and the contagious Easter egg hunts have raised thousands of dollars um, for MPS6 and all the society programs. It's, it's really been fun, fun to watch. Um, Kimber's upbeat spirit and uh, Lila's big smiles have warmed hearts over the past few years to many throughout Wisconsin and across the country. So congratulations to Kimber in receiving the National MPS Society uh, Year's Fundraising Award. Kimber, congratulations if you'll come up. grab I'm missing one paper all right I want to make sure I'm definitely prepared for this uh, next award which is the National MPS Society's Chairman's Award and I am uh, excited also to uh, award our Chairman's Award this year to uh, Reverend Wayne Eppenheimer. Wayne is an outstanding long-term member of the MPS community and really uh, a role model uh, for many of us in the MPS community. Um, Wayne uh, was born in 1956 as the youngest of four children. And Wayne uh, had uh, four, uh, he was the youngest of four children and Wayne was uh, growing up a, li a little bit different in those times with several medical issues. And as you can imagine, especially in those days, uh, the doctors were really unsure um, what was going on. And there was just not a widespread knowledge, as there is not today, really, of, of Hunter syndrome. Uh, but when Wayne was a teenager, the Shriners Hospital in Pennsylvania provided him with a probable diagnosis of MPS2, and he was officially diagnosed after his 24th birthday. In spite of Wayne's medical issues, he graduated from high school and earned his bachelor's degree in Pennsylvania and went on to complete a graduate program in seminary. And it is in college where he met his wife, Joan, and together they began a pastoral ministry that's been going on now for more than 40 years. Wayne began the ministry in 1980 in New York and then moved to Jamestown um, in 1990 where Wayne and Joan raised their two daughters, Joella and Julia. And after 30 years as a pastor in Jamestown, Wayne retired in 2019. 
Raising awareness to get funding for the National MPS Society was an important thing to Wayne, and he's helped raise that awareness and fund further research locally in Jamestown. Joan started a business called Pearl City Popcorn with profits going to the National MPS Society and other charities. And for the month of May, Wayne and Joan host the Purple Bag Sales, their signature caramel corn uh, available in purple bags. Did you bring any of that? <laughs> it just sounds delicious, right? Um, Pearl City Popcorn is owned by Wayne and Joan with the product available at two stores in Jamestown. And this year, the mayor of Jamestown made a proclamation declaring May 15th, MPS Awareness Day for the city in honor of Wayne and his family contribution to the local community. Wayne has been involved in the MPS Society since its earliest days after his diagnosis, and over the years, he's participated in several protocols and treatment options that have been developed for MPS disorders. Most recently, he's participating in an ongoing genetic therapy clinical trial that's paving the way once again for all of us Thank you, Wayne, that's amazing. Paving the way for all of us um, on this journey with MPS and ML, ML, excuse me. Thank you, Wayne, again, for all of your contributions over many, many years, and again, being such an outstanding role model to all of us in the MPS community. And with that, Wayne, the Chairman's Award, please come up. Thank you. And I'm going to uh, introduce or turn it over to our moderator this morning, Steve Holland. Thank you, Lisa. So the, for the first time in National MPS Society history, we're a little ahead of schedule. So. <laughs> We want to recognize this moment and savor it, I think. <laughs> anyway, to uh, introduce myself, my name is Steve Holland. I'm the current uh, vice chairman of the National MPS Society, father of three MPS1 children, Spencer, Madison, and Laney. And uh, the girls are with us today, so maybe you'll run into them. It is my distinct honor to chair our session this morning, MPS NML Management and Care. So we've got several, I uh, believe four talks lined up from four experts and we're looking forward to hearing, hearing these gentlemen. Our uh, first session is um, going to be overview and treatment status of MPS and ML23. And uh, we welcome Joseph Munzer to speak to us. Uh, Dr. Munzer is a professor of pediatrics and uh, genetics at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill where he has practiced since 1993. Many of our families have been there to see him. I know mine has. Uh, he's also the director of the recently created MPS Research and Treatment Center at the University of North Carolina. So that's something new. You can ask him about that. He may speak about that a little bit. Um, also, uh, he's been involved in the diagnosis, management, and treatment of MPS patients for many years including serving as the principal investigator for several of the enzyme replacement therapies and even the gene editing trial uh, that was done. He served on our scientific advisory board for many years. And uh, please welcome Joseph Munzer. There we go. <laughs> so 
I acknowledge that the future speakers ahead of me are going to have to adjust the microphone. <laughs> One, I want to congratulate Wayne. You could, he can tell you the story of how he first met me years ago. <laughs> and then he also got involved in the, you know, they said the gene editing trial. I also want to thank Terry for the opportunity to speak this morning in terms of to give this um, presentation in the National MPS Society. Uh, it's always my pleasure to come to this meeting. You know, it's nice to see old family friends. In some way, that, that we know there's going to be new. And it's, you know, again, as I joke with people, I'm a nice guy, but you don't really want to see me in terms of my academic practice since I take care of very difficult disorders. But thank you all for coming. I have lots of disclosures, as you already heard. I serve as a consultant and, and on advisory boards for a variety of biotech companies. And I'm currently involved in a number of clinical trials, as you can see here. I've also in the past been involved in the MPS1 and 2 enzyme replacement trials. What I'm going to do is very briefly give a talk about ML2 and 3, just very few slides since there are a few individuals here, but focus most of my time talking about MPS. <coughs> You know, one, the clinical features, treatment options, <clears throat> and at the end, something to do a little different in terms of talking about limitations of current treatment and what we may need to improve outcomes. Let's just focus on ML2 and 3. They're both, they're really a group, a, two groups of lysosomal storage disorders due to deficiency of a particular enzyme and acetyl glucosamine 1-phosphotransferase, or probably easier to say phosphotransferase. Um, you heard a little bit from Dr. Sands about this particular enzyme and how they've modified the enzyme to make it less complex and still function and may open the opportunities for uh, treatment of these disorders, but right now it's still in the experimental stage. The hallmark of these <coughs> disorders is really the inability for a lysosome enzyme to get to the lysosome uh, and resulting in, in the extracellular space or outside cells. Uh, very high levels and very low levels in the lysosome. So the diagnosis can be made typically by doing a number of different enzymes, and what you find is they're all elevated uh, in serum, but they're very low inside cells. Unfortunately, these are all progressive disorders like all the lysosomal storage disorders, and because all cells have these housekeeping enzymes in it, we see the <coughs> disorder affecting virtually every cell in the body. There's a wide range of clinical involvement, even within the ML2 and 3, and I'll briefly sort of talk about that in a second. But unfortunately for the ML2 and 3, there really is no definitive treatment. It's really supportive care, unfortunately, and hopefully within the future that will change. But right now, uh, there is only supportive care. As you'll see a type of slide like this in the future, these are really spectrum. It's not a single two disorders, ML2 and 3, but really a continuum, and I consider that ML2 and 3 really to be the, trans the fossil transferase deficiency and from very severe form or ML2 or eye cell disease to the much more attenuated uh, uh, ML3 patients. Clearly patients with eye cell have a very shortened lifespan, they have significant cognitive impairment, uh, they can have gum disease, they have big tongues, they have you know, bone problems, airway, cardiac disease are all significant along with joint contractures. So, but early on in the diagnosis, one can't predict where you are. You can be diagnosed at two or three, and it could be a much milder form than you might anticipate. So that's the challenge both for the ML disorders as long as the, cha as the challenge for the MPS disorders. So unfortunately, that's all I'm going to say right now in terms of ML2 and ML3, and hopefully in the future we'll have opportunity to talk about therapy for these disorders, uh, which we don't have today. So in terms of the MPS, it's, it's, for most of you, that's pretty sort of a straightforward slide, but I want to just talk a little bit about that there is a lot of different MPSs, and if you go around this meeting and look at the, talk to families, you'll meet all sorts of individuals with different forms of MPS, and it's just how variable it is, and that's one of the challenges. It's rare, but still very variable. There's 11 known enzyme deficiencies currently comprising seven different clinical forms of MPS. There's still probably a few more forms of MPS to be discovered because, for example, in the, in the mouse there's a, a MPS, uh, a MPS uh, 5, or it's, uh, not MPS 5, but it's a, it's, a, it's a type of MPS that's 3 that's really not described in humans, so there's going to be more forms in the future. Each MPS disorder is quite rare in the neighborhood of 1 in 100,000. Uh, but as an aggregate, they're probably 1 in 20 to 1 in 25,000. 
As we all appreciate in this room, the hallmark of these disorders is the tissue storage of glycosaminoglycans. And what are they? <clears throat> They're really, uh, gags are, are chains of carbohydrates that are in, in the body attached to a protein backbone uh, in the extracellular space and the cell surfaces, and they have a variety of biological functions, which I won't really talk about, but a lot are still being elucidated. But these molecules need to be turned over. As cells turn over, they need to be broken down and recycled, and that's the difficulty with MPS. These gags are the primary storage material due to the inability to recycle or break down these molecules to simple sugars, <coughs> which then the body reuses. And the body is very good at recycling things, and when it can't recycle, they accumulate. <coughs> as, as with ML2 and ML3, and we've seen yesterday, these are really progressive disorders with multi-system involvement. And again, for each MPS disorder, there's a wide range of, of clinical involvement. And I joke sometimes when I talk about MPS, I could spend half an hour, an hour on each individual MPS disorder, let, let alone spending 40 minutes on all of them. So, so don't let me, give, don't give me five hours to talk with, I'll spend five hours talking about each one and, and give you more details than you ever want to know about them. This is one of my favorite slides, you know, some of my patients I'm taking from the internet, just showing the variability. In contrast, Wayne used to see this slide and see himself, but I took it away and put another slide in his place, and he probably thanked me for that because he was probably expecting to see himself here <laughs> because in the past he has seen himself at a younger self. <laughs> but an adult with MPS2 to a four-year-old with MPS1 to a San Filippo to an MPS1 to a Merkia. Just showing you the variability if you look across this, and it's just, this is the challenge of this order, but this is the uniqueness of this meeting. People come together and really see, you know, other people with similar disorders and get a chance that they're not unique, they're not alone, because many times I've heard people say, well, I'm the only one with this problem. It's absolutely not the case. The only one that your physician may be aware of, but they're all, these individuals have all MPSs are all around the country, uh, and, but they're just not well recognized for a lot of people where they are. Nomenclature has always been challenging. I'll just briefly touch on that. Historically, Hurler syndrome used to equal MPS. So if you pay, people talked about Hurler syndrome, they really referred to all the MPSs. And then there was the Hunter form of Hurler syndrome. And now we have a much more systematic nomenclature by types, uh, and you can see here MPS1, 2, and 3 are by far the most common, uh, and that's how they were initially sort of recognized in terms of that order. Uh, in contrast, MPS1 and 2 have a single enzyme deficiency where you'll see San Filippo, there's four enzyme deficiencies all with the same clinical phenotype. In the US, once you go beyond MPS1, 2, and 3, it's much rarer. Morchial syndrome, MPS4, there's two enzyme deficiencies. A is by far the most common. B is quite rare, and I haven't seen a, a B patient in, in many a year, and, and I'm not sure how many B patients are out there. Uh, we don't longer use uh, MPS uh, 5 and, and 7, or excuse me, 5 and 8. MPS 5 was Shea syndrome and thought to be a separate disorder until uh, people recognized the biochemistry and that Shea syndrome was really the mild or attenuated form of MPS 1. MPS6 meritolomy, a single enzyme deficiency as, as Sly syndrome. And we have MPS9 hyaluronidase. To my knowledge, there's no hyaluronidase patients recognized in the US. Uh, it's still not clear uh, what the true spectrum of that disorder is, but maybe with time we'll recognize that because they, people probably are missed because the few patients recognized to date have joint disease and swelling around the joints, and it could be easily missed for a rheumatoid arthritis picture. And so uh, time may tell we may have more in that. What's the biochemistry? Each of the MPS enzyme deficiencies result in a block in the breakdown of the glycosaminoglycans. Here's the example for MPS1, where the enzyme iuronidase, which is shown here, this enzyme is supposed to cleave off an ironic acid at the non-reducing end of the dermatin sulfate can't do that, and then all the other enzymes stop. And so it's this result of this unique biochemistry why we have these disorders. Yes, we get a little interchain cleavage, but again, we can't break down these molecules and they accumulate and cause all sorts of issues. 
One of those is the first is really this disruption of the lysosome. Here's two slides of fibroblasts. <clears throat> the one on the left shows these, as you saw yesterday, these clear areas in cells. These clear areas are really the lysosomes that are grossly distended and, and really take over the cell and really crowd out and, and really disrupt the dysfunction of that cell. Uh, normally, in the left or the normal fibroblasts, there's lysosomes here, but they're barely, you can't really see them on this image. Uh, but they're there, they're tiny lysosomes because the material comes into the lysosome, gets broken down, and gets removed. I use the analogy in terms of recycling issues. I have a bin in a garage. If you put stuff every day into that bin and then once a week take it to the curb, it nicely functions as you re recycle that material. But if you put stuff in that bin every day and never take it to the curb, what happens? Within a week, that bin starts to overflow. If you keep putting stuff in that, the garage starts filling up, and if you keep putting stuff in there, the garage becomes non-functional. That's the analogy of this disorder for what happens when you can't recycle compounds. And that's really the beginning, but then there's all sorts of secondary issues <coughs> that we really don't understand, and I'll show you that in a second. Well, what's the pathophysiology? What's really the, the uniqueness of these disorders? One of the key issues is that the amount of residual enzymatic activity appears to be the main driver of clinical severity. So what do I mean by that? I mean that if you have no enzyme whatsoever, you really have the severest form. If you have a little bit, a half of 1%, you have a milder form. If you have 3 or 4%, you probably are never come to clinical attention because we don't recognize that. There's enough enzyme to result in, the, in this not having anything broken down. <clears throat> The other key issue and why we see this variability is that the major classes of accumulating glycosamic glycans are not equally distributed throughout the body. Heparin sulfate is primarily found in the central nervous system. Dermatin sulfate outside the central nervous system, or I call somatic or physical part of the body. And then keratin sulfate is in the bone, and keratin sulfate disorders are really the two morchio, MPS 4A and B. This unique glycosamic glycan distribution results in what we see, the variable diseases among the different types from MPS1 to Morchio to Maritolome. <clears throat> and as I alluded to earlier, there's this, this, this accumulation results in a really a complex cascade, a disruption of cellular pathology. And I could literally spend you know, a long time just talking about this one side. I just show this as an example. You basically have a deficiency of a lysosomal enzyme. This results in storage, but then what happens next is really much more complex, and it really could be a whole talk in itself, but you can see all sorts of different things happen with, because of that storage. But more importantly, once some of these processes are happening, it's hard to turn them around. It's hard to stop them. They can keep going, and so that's one of the keys probably that becomes irreversible, some of the changes we see because of these secondary processes. It's really spectrum of disease. It's not just one disorder, as this meeting really shows if you talk to different families. You know, MPS1, 2, and 7 all have multisystemic, that is, have lots of different organ systems involved, and has CNS involvement, but they never have only CNS involvement. And that's where, in contrast, the San Filippos are primarily a neurological or central nervous system disorder, and they primarily have neurologic problems and do not have the physical disease we see in the other forms of MPS. Where in contrast, Morchio, MPS4, it's really a skeletal disorder where that's with normal intellect and the skeleton is the primary focus of their disability. MPS6, as you heard a lot about from, from Dr. Harmatz yesterday, is really, again, a, has lots of somatic but overwhelming disease but normal intellect. Uh, <clears throat> and then MPS7 is very similar to uh, MPS1, but it can present much earlier in a lot of forms as sort of non-immune hydrops fatalis, a unique uh, presentation where individuals have really lots of swelling in the, in the womb, and that can result a lot of times in premature death and sometimes uh, uh, really challenging diagnostic issues. I won't talk about all this, but virtually every organ system in the body is involved. You can read through the list and, and see the list, but it's just, it, this is one of the challenges for the MPS. It's just not a single problem. It's really every organ system can be involved. Uh, so let's now talk about individual disorders and I'll briefly talk about them before I uh, talk about some of the challenges. 
So MPS1 is Iorani's deficiency onset in the severe form, her lower syndrome before six months of age. <coughs> You can see in this picture, Chris is about four years old. He has a classic feature of untreated Hurler syndrome, the big head, <coughs> you know, depressed nasal bridge. If you look closely, he'd have corneal clouding. He's got his tongue that always hangs out the macroglossia. He can't fully extend his arms. He has, you know, curved fingers. If you feel the abdomen, he would have a patospinomegaly, uh, and he has decreased joint range of motion. Unfortunately, untreated, these patients die between three and 10 years of age of, of both uh, neurologic, but airway and cardiac disease, and again, it's a rare autosomal recessive disorder. Uh, with newborn screening in the U.S., we're going to someday get a true understanding of the incidence, but one in 100,000 is probably still a pretty good estimate. <coughs> the spectrum of disease, and her historically, there was Hurler syndrome, there was Shea syndrome, and then people thought there was sort of this unique form of Hurler Shea. And in reality, this is really a continuum disorder. All have Iorani's deficiency, uh, and people can fall across this spectrum. And I can't tell you where Hurler syndrome ends and Hurler Shea starts. In the same way with Hurler Shea to Shea, you can, that boundary is, is really no boundaries to continuum, and everybody is unique. And that's one of the challenges that there's virtually no two identical patients as I'll show you in a second. You know, Hurler syndrome, we all appreciate, untreated is severe cognitive impairment, airway and cardiac disease, you know, corneal clouding, uh, uh, just the standard issues where Shea is adults who are intellectually intact. They can have all the physical involvement and can die very premature because of airway and cardiac disease. And Hurler Shea is sort of in the middle and it's really variable. And, and it's, we now typically use the terminology Hurler or severe MPS1 and attenuated and really lump Hurler Shea and Shea into attenuated, but it's just an artificial lumping because again, it's really one disorder at the continuum spectrum. As you can see here, three individuals who were involved in the initial enzyme replacement trial for MPS1, Hurler, Hurler Shea and Shea, all have virtually undetectable enzyme activity where the individual with Hurler clearly had none whatsoever, where the individual on the right had half of 1% residual activity, and that resulted uh, in her being spared the intellectual uh, <coughs> problems that we see in MPS, in the Hurler syndrome, but still has lots of physical disease. Not sure what happened to the lights there, but <laughs> we'll continue. But more importantly, that the diagnostic assay cannot separate out zero from half of 1%. You have deficiency, and so the diagnostic assay tells you have MPS1, but it cannot tell you this fair. In a research lab, yes, we can sort out a little more sometimes what happens, but you know, routinely we can't do that diagnostically. We all appreciate all the MPSs are progressive disorders. And if you look at this picture, you know, it's this young lady at 10 months of age. That face is really not obvious that she has MPS1. If you examine the rest of her, you would find that she has some kyphosis. Look closer, she'd have a little bit of cornea clouding, have some hepatomegaly. But obviously, by 36 months, you can see without really uh, treatment, she has progressed. And this is the nature of this progressive disorder. The gags are constantly being stored and causing more and more damage. And this applies to all the MPSs and the, and the ML2 and 3 disorders. The other challenge is that even within, if you take this hurler shade that's more intermediate, there's all sorts of variability. And this is one of the uniqueness. Every, every MPS child is, I consider somewhat unique and has its own unique characteristics. Individual on the left has severe joint disease, had a pracheostomy at about eight years of age because of severe heart and airway disease, but has modest liver enlargement. Individual on the far right has massive liver enlargement, has relatively milder joint disease, but has significant airway, and the individual in the middle has really no airway issues, no sleep apnea, but has severe joint disease. And this is the challenge. Everybody's a little different. In terms of MPS1, in terms of genotype, phenotype, the genotype is what the DNA changes are versus phenotype is what your clinical appearance is. And so can we use the DNA changes to predict clinical picture or phenotype? And we can for MPS better than we can for a lot of the others. There's, there's a, at least 15, a lot more than that, known so-called nonsense mutation. The nonsense mutation is something that makes results in no enzyme being made and W402X and Q70X are two of the most common. So if you have, if you're homozygous or have two copies of a nonsense mutation, then you always have 
Hurler syndrome, because you make no enzyme whatsoever. If you have a so-called missense change, where a, sim a single amino acid is changed within the protein, this typically allows some residual enzyme activity. So if you have a missense uh, a mutation, then you typically have an attenuated form because there is a little bit of residual activity. And R89Q is one example of the most common for MPS1. But other mutations, other, other variants, this P533R, can give you, if you have two copies of that, can result in either severe disease or attenuated. And it's not clear what changes in that individual. And so sometime in the future, hopefully, we'll have a better understanding what modified this little bit of activity and makes some individuals who have some enzyme attenuated or others with the same genotype severe. So there's still more work to be done. As you heard from Dr. Burton yesterday, there are pseudodeficiency alleles that have been reported but they're really not disease causing, and if you have a pseudodeficiency allele, you pretty much do not have an MPS disorder. So switching gears from MPS1 to MPS2, MPS2 is deficiency of the enzyme ironate 2 sulfatase. Other people call it ironate sulfatase, depending where you're, uh, where you're trained. Onset of symptoms typically in the severest form of MPS2 occur a little later than the severe, than the severe MPS1 patients, Hurler syndrome. Unfortunately, untreated MPS2 patients who are severe die in their teenage years of overwhelming neurologic disease uh, and combination of airway and cardiac. And that has changed now for both MPS1 and 2, as we'll talk a little more about it in a little bit. In, these are, again, a rare disorder, probably estimated incidence 1 in 100,000 now with newborn screening going to be happening in the U.S. We'll get a better sense for what the true incidence is in the U.S. Um, down the road in, in five years or so. <coughs> that in contrast to MPS1 and all the other MPS disorders, this is inherited as an X link. In this case, what we see is males are primarily only affected and females are carriers. Carrier females do not have any clinical disease, where in other lysosomal storage, other lysosomal storage disorders, carrier females can be symptomatic, but we've never seen that in MPS2. There are a small number of females with MPS2, so it can happen, but it's from completely different mechanisms that are unique to this, uh, how the X chromosome is handled within cells. This is just a slide showing some of the prevalence, how common it is, and the median age of onset of some of the, what I call common signs and symptoms, some of the features. So if you look at the bottom here, you know, otitis media, hernias, nasal obstruction, all tend to occur average, you know, at, at the youngest age, but can occur at almost any age, even in the, fifth, in, even in the first few months of life, where things like cardiac disease and, and, and scoliosis or kyphosis tend to occur later, even though they can occur earlier. So there's just a lot of variability of how things present, but in general, you can make some predictions of what's going to happen with time. And this is, again, before any uh, enzyme replacement therapy has happened really a, a spectrum of disease, you know, from the very severe in terms of individual here, Craig, who was, uh, you know, onset of symptoms early on in life, uh, had progressive cognitive issues and certainly involvement of, can have involvement of cardiac and airway, to basically the adult with MPS2. Again, if Wayne has seen this slide in the past, it used to be him, but it's no longer him. He's got upgraded. <laughs> but again, this issue of Variable onset, normal intellect, but life expectancy can be variable depending on how much organ involvement you can have. In contrast, we're trying to use different terminologies because severe and attenuated don't really sort of speak, attenuated doesn't really tell you what's happening. And so we've tried to use the term neuronopathic for severe and non neuronopathic for the attenuated. It sort of works, but it still doesn't work. We don't have good terms because it's hard to give one term to explain both the physical disease and the brain disease. The genetics of MPS2 are, have been well recognized, and, and the, probably the key is that the gene lies on the distal arm of the X chromosome. X chromosome. But more importantly, if you have there are, in this case, you can have complete deletion. The gene is not even present. It gets deleted or removed. If you have that or rearrangements occur in this about 15 to 20 percent, 
These are always associated with severe disease. So if you have this, I can say to you that your child's going to have severe disease. It can be a little variable in terms of when it occurs, but it's always going to result in neurological compromise if untreated. Unfortunately, most families have private mutations where you can't really predict the severity, and we need to do a better job uh, with that, and hopefully in the future we'll have that where we can sort of start gathering more of these mutations, more of these variant changes, and really say, did, in this particular change, can we make a prediction? Because with newborn screening, that's going to be a challenge for MPS2. It's going to be a challenge to figure out how to intervene and what to do. Just because you have enzyme deficiency doesn't mean you're going to have severe disease. You're going to have MPS2, but it doesn't mean you're going to have severe disease. And so that's a challenge that we have to, going to have to face. And so even newborn screening is really positive. It's going to give us another perspective to try to figure out what works and doesn't work. In terms of we see some common features within uh, the central nervous system of the MPS2 or the severe, and again, it's, it's progressive cognitive impairment. They have behavioral issues, you know, this hyperactivity, aggressive behavior, artistic-like behavior. We see seizures, probably a lifetime risk, about 25 to 50 percent for the severe patients. They can have increased intracranial pressure causing a communicating hydrocephalus. Hearing loss occurs both in severe and attenuated. And there's a lot, you know, in both severe and attenuated have this decreased night and peripheral vision due to a rod dystria, a particular cell type in the back of the retina that affects this. I should say that we don't see these behavior issues in MPS1, but we do see similar behavior issues in San Filippo in terms of the, there are a lot of similarities in terms of what happens, the behavior of the San Filippo individual compared to the MPS2. But it's very different from MPS1 or Hurler syndrome. One of the unique diagnostic features is that MPS2 patients can have these pebbly lesions over their backs. And when you see that, that's just diagnostic of MPS2. It has no clinical significance. It tends to occur more in severe, but there is more severe patients. About two-thirds of MPS uh, patients are severe, and about a third are attenuated. San, San Filippo syndrome, in contrast, MPS1 and 2 all have the same clinical features or phenotype. Uh, but there's four different enzyme deficiencies. You know, the major feature there really this uh, mental deterioration with time, hyperactivity, mild physical or somatic features, and unfortunately death in the teenage years typically of overwhelming neurologic disease. Uh, most of the, the severe patients by the time they're six or ten are, are severely involved, but it really can be somewhat variable. And we know they're milder forms, but unfortunately, these are not diagnosed very readily because of lack of awareness. And now with sequencing available much more readily, I've seen uh, three, two or three adults who have been diagnosed with MPS3 uh, based on DNA testing where they just did whole genome sequencing and, and got the, the answer to their surprise of physicians. Just showing you some young individuals with MPS3, relatively mild physical features, but can get profound mental deterioration. <clears throat> so Morchio syndrome, or MPS4, two different enzyme defects. Morchio A is by far the most common. Morchio B is very rare. Uh, and I'm not sure if I've seen a, a Morchio B patient at, at this meeting ever. Uh, MPS4A probably has one and a quarter million, but it's not really proof. The instance is not really known, but it's currently much rarer than MPS1, 2, 3A, and B. So again, one MPS1, MPS2, MPS3, and MPS3A and 3B all are roughly similar in terms of frequency, in terms of around one in 100,000 probably. In, in Morchio syndrome, the skeleton or the bones are the primary organ of involvement, even though we can see other involvements, uh, and they typically have normal intellect. And again, it's an autosomal recessive disease. Both parents have to be carriers to have the disorder. Again, some just pictures of individuals with Morchio syndrome. We see a lot of children with Morchio in wheelchairs because of significant hip disease, um, and also sort of you know inability to walk because of their joint laxity. And Morchio syndrome is unique in the fact that joints are lax, where in all the other forms of MPS one, two, and six, and seven, they have joint stiffness or contractures. MPS uh, 6 is Maritolome. You heard more about this from, from Dr. Harmatz yesterday in terms of aerosulfatase B. Again, intellectually intact, but it can have life-threatening physical disease and in a severe form can die very premature from overwhelming cardiac and airway disease. And that's why uh, enzyme replacement has been so valuable for this disorder because it can dramatically halt that progression. 
It's much rarer than the other forms. Uh, and again, autosomal recessive disorder. <coughs> Here, just a slide from, uh, <coughs> from PS6, just showing you this sort of called, referring to rapidly and slowly progressing. The rapidly means that the more severe form, they, they develop disease much earlier compared to the slower progressing form, which will still develop disease but take much longer. I think probably Paul knows all these individuals. I think on the one on the right is from uh, uh, Australia, but I'm not sure of that. But he, I think he probably knows all these. But again, you know, this, the rapidly progressing have much earlier onset. Again, you know, the individual on the right, you can't really appreciate from his face, but if you examine him, you would recognize he has evidence of uh, MPS. And, Sly syndrome, MPS7, deficiency of beta-glucuronidase deficiency, uh, has similar involvement to MPS1 in terms of both can have overwhelming somatic disease uh, and central nervous system disease, but never ever has central nervous system disease by itself. As I alluded to before, non-immune hydropsitalis is probably the common presentation of this disorder in, in the U.S. Uh, and I don't know what that really the true incidence is, I put one and a half million, but it'd be interesting it was time now that enzymes available, whether we sort of understand the true incidence, whether it's more common than that or not. And again, autosomal recessive disorder. I wanna, because of newborn, <coughs> newborn screening, <coughs> excuse me, because of newborn screening, I just wanna sort of say how I define MPS. So, to have an MPS disorder, you need two things. You need evidence of gag storage. That is either clinical features that are consistent with this and or elevated <coughs> urinary gag. It could be, could be blood gags, but need to be elevated, need to be urine gags, need to be gags, need to be elevated, showing that you actually have an enzyme deficiency that results in things being accumulated. And again, of course, you need an enzyme deficiency. So you need both. Enzyme deficiency by itself does not give you an MPS diagnosis, and that's so important for newborn screening because unless you have the evidence of storage, you can easily have a pseudo-deficiency as we've seen now very frequently with MPS1. Clearly, these days, it's really nice to have then the confirmatory diagnosis that you have two abnormal changes in the gene as referred to as either pathogenic, that is most likely that's the cause, or likely pathogenic. Uh, there, we can, you've heard the term maybe variance of unknown significance, and that's, if you have that, it doesn't mean, we don't know what the significance of that change is in terms of disease causing. So it's important to have evidence of gag storage and deficient enzyme. Deficient enzyme by itself is not enough. The diagnosis really, unfortunately, is clinical suspicion, clinical suspicion, clinical suspicion. You don't think about it, you'll never make it. And for this audience, it's already beyond this point, but if you're geneticists or other people, and a lot of you realize it takes time, and this is this issue of newborn screening, this so-called diagnostic odyssey, uh, because people don't think about it. You know, time that an MPS patient comes to my clinic for a possibility, I can walk through my waiting area and pick up my new patient without have, ever having seen them, just because they already have so many physical features. Again, if you think about it, I typically recommend x-ray, spine, chest, or hand, or do now these days a particular quantification of total urine gag analysis and so-called component analysis. Our ability to measure gags are much more sophisticated now than they were 20 years ago. 20 years ago, maybe a fourth, maybe a half, but a fourth to a half of San Filippo patients were missed because their urine gags were normal because the assay wasn't very sensitive. Uh, with the current technology, that's not the case anymore. We'll pick up all those individuals. So the gold standard is really measuring the deficient enzyme once, you th once you're concerned about a possible MPS. Or you can do the deficient enzyme testing if you think of their high suspicion, even though it's a urine gag. And this applied historically. You know, I saw a number of San Filippo families historically who came to me for a second opinion in retrospect that they were told they don't have disease, but they had lots of issues consistent with San Filippo. And yes, when you measure the enzyme, the right enzyme, you found the answer. And if you did more sophisticated gag analysis, you found the answer. So what about treatment? I've shown this slide for many years because it's really sort of the, you know, the, the basis for treatment. Enzymatic correction has been possible at the cellular level in fibroblasts for long before we ever have any therapies. 
due to the following observations. Cultured cells, that is, take fibroblast skin cells and put them in culture and grow them, they release small amounts of lysosomal enzyme. And today, my mentor Liz Neufeld is actually going to get a prize, get an award here at this uh, meeting, and it's going to be great. I haven't seen her in a few years, but she coined these correction factors with the idea that cells release small amounts of enzyme, and then can be taken up by other cells around that, or back into the same cell in theory, uh, and help correct that. And we know there's a very, as you heard yesterday, a very effective mechanism to get cells from inside the cell, from, excuse me, from outside the cell, inside the cell. And it has the long name of mannose-6-phosphate receptor mediated uptake, but that's really a very efficient process. So the key, if you can get the enzyme missing in that cell to the cell surface, by and large, you can get correct that cell. The challenge is getting the enzyme to that cell surface because there's a lot of areas, like in the bone disease, where you can't get enzyme into those spaces. As I already alluded to, you only need one or two percent probably residual activity in a cell to normalize that cell function and correct the storage. But the key is getting it into that cell. Our two current treatment options are hematopoietic stem cell transplantation and intravenous enzyme replacement therapy. This is my view of the world in terms of what's currently happening for treatment options for MPS. I first want to focus on transplantation. You're going to hear a lot more about that from Paul Orchard, uh, but this is just my sort of very brief perspective. There's over 800 patients, and I don't know, Paul, maybe that's probably underestimated yet, but I'm, who knows what that number truly is, have received either allogenetic bone marrow and more recently cord blood transplants. Success, successful and stable engraftment in severe m one patients has resulted in clinical improvement of their somatic disease. We don't see it with the bones, unfortunately or the eyes and clearly increase long-term survival. We now avoid the use of MPS1 carriers as donors, and you probably hear more about that from or Dr. Orchard. And MPS1, if you're under two years of age, have Hurler syndrome, transplantation is really the treatment of choice. One cannot say that, oops, sorry, before that, just you'll hear more about microglia cells of the central nervous system, really are bone marrow origin and believed to be the source of the enzyme, again, the neuropsychological outcomes have varied widely after transplant for MPS individuals. For MPS1, it really had the best outcome. It's much more variable for other forms, and you'll hear about that uh, later this morning. And the timing is really critical. I think that's probably what makes the big difference. If you, once you have significant neurologic disease, it's very difficult to change that course. One of the challenges we have now in terms of historically MPS2 and MPS3A and B have not been recommended for transplantation because typically they've been transplanted late. Uh, now that with newborn screening for MPS2, some people are going the route of transplantation. It's unclear how well that worked because we know if we transplant later, they don't work as well, and whether there's a uniqueness between the, the different MPS is how they respond. And I'll let Dr. Orchard challenge, take that challenge for his talk. And I'll, if he doesn't answer, tell you about it, I may ask him that question to put him on the spot. <laughs> I've never been known to do that. <laughs> As we all are aware of, ERT is available in the replacement therapy for MPS 1, 2, uh, 4A, 6, and 7. In general, for the MPSs, IV ERT and MPS result in reduction of urine gag excretion and decrease liver and spleen size. That pretty much uniformly should happen. We see improved joint range of motion, pulmonary function, energy and increased endurance in some patients after ERT, but the lack of progression should really be considered success in MPS. That's really the key because reversal of clinical disease is usually not possible once you have it. So just stabilization, and that's been always a challenge for approval because the FDA likes to see clinical benefit, but to me, clinical benefit is no change in a progressive disorder, and that's always been a challenge for regulatory bodies. ERT is beneficial for some, the physical disease, except for the skeleton and the eye, uh, and also probably carpal tunnel, and it's not expected to help the brain disease because of the blood-brain barrier you heard about yesterday. What are some of the limitations and why? So it's easier to prevent the onset of clinical disease than to stop significantly or to stop or significantly slow disease progression. So it's important to try to start earlier. 
most MPS patients at time of diagnosis already have significant disease burden, and we see that. There's limited data, but it really suggests that gag accumulation already starts in utero, and that's not surprising given that the enzyme deficiency is there, and we see MPS7, uh, they have this, this non-immune hydrop fatalis is really due to already the disease process affecting their body. The short half-life, that is how long the enzyme remains in circulation, really limits the amount of enzyme taken up by some cell types because some cell types take it up slower and the enzyme doesn't last long and the liver is really a sink. The liver takes far more enzyme than you like. As we all appreciate who, who do ERT, it's weekly infusions. Fortunately, insurance by and large covers this, but lots of parts of the world, this is a major issue. It's very expensive and does not treat the brain disease. Many of the somatic features, though, we see in MPSs are not typically responded to either IV ERT or to transplantation. For example, synovium, that is the, the lining, the inner lining of the joints, that's probably not impacted because it's a relatively avascular where blood supply is not readily there and so it's hard to get to. Prachia, the scalp, the bone disease, the cornea clouding, carpal tunnel syndrome, all are probably need other approaches to help them. Again, we have no effective treatment options for most of the MPS patients <coughs> with central nervous system or cognitive impairment. That, that's MPS2, that MPS San Filippos, uh, <coughs> and MPS7. Except for the MPS1 patients who undergo early transplantation. The current dose approved for each IV ERT is beneficial but it's probably not the optimal one. We don't have an, a way to yet sort of tailor what patient needs more, what patient needs less. Shortening the ERT infusion time is really convenient. Nice to have a short infusion for an hour versus three or four hours. But, but, if, but, but if you shorten the infusion, that may result in more enzyme being delivered to the liver and not reaching the harder to reach tissues because of how long the enzyme lasts in blood, and the liver sort of tends to suck it up nonspecifically. It may be that the ideal infusion time is one or two days, because, but we don't know what it really is, but I do not recommend shortening the infusion time, uh, you know, to, particularly for MPS2, where the, the prescription or the approval process says one to three hours. I've always was against the one hour, and I've cured people to go to the longer sort of standard infusion of three hours. Important to realize that the circulating enzyme in the bloodstream is not active. It doesn't do anything in the blood. It only works when it gets into the cell and then into the lysosome. So it's important that, you know, where it goes. So what do we need to improve outcome? When treatment is available, identifying patients by newborn screening and starting treatment before onset of clinical disease should really improve outcomes, as you heard yesterday. So ideally, we should have newborn screening for MPS 1 and 2, as we do now, recommended, but for MPS 4A, 6 and 7, all should have newborn screening because we can do so much better if we can start treatment prior to significant disease. One of the challenges is, should everybody be treated who has a diagnosis of MPS? And it may be, I just was talking to a California family yesterday who has a really attenuated form uh, and it's unclear you know, when the ideal time to start that. If, if you have no signs of clinical disease, I typically would wait to start treatment. So even though you have a diagnosis of MPS1, if you can't recognize anything uh, on a on detailed exam, uh, you may want to wait and watch. And that's going to be a challenge because people are not, not comfortable waiting and watching sometimes. One of the other challenges is we need a better understanding of the impact of antibodies against administered enzyme because a lot of indi individuals develop high circulating antibodies because they make no protein whatsoever prior to treatment and now they're basically giving back the missing enzyme is like a foreign body. And so that's a significant issue this, that we haven't yet really resolved and probably need to sort of do immune modulation for these disorders but that's the next really, one of the next frontiers. One of the other things that may be beneficial is to give much higher amounts <coughs> of enzyme. The, the current doses are probably not enough. They work, but they're not enough. And so some of the recent data that you heard yesterday coming out of an MPS1 ex vivo gene therapy trial where patients' own bone marrow cells are taken out of the body, 
infused with the lentiviral vector, giving a much higher content of the MPS1 gene given back. And those individuals make high amounts of enzymes, sometimes up to five-fold normal, not 5%, but five-fold normal, and you see a dramatic improvement in their outcome. So that may be one of the ways to get much improvement for some of these harder to reach tissues, even though it's still the debate is not clear what's going to happen. The other possibility is to use small molecules, which can get into areas where a large enzyme cannot get into. And here's just a list there. You can just look at that list of things potentially small molecules could do, and that's probably one of the other areas in the future there'll be, you'll hear a lot more about in terms of uh, that. As you also heard yesterday, there's a phase one clinical trial of in utero ERT, ERT for lysosomal storage. There's been one patient with Pompe treated. My impression is there's an MPS1 patient that potentially the candidate. Uh, and so we're going to see more of this and see how that impacts what happens. And so that's just the beginning, and you're going to hear a lot more about that over time. But again, this does not help a lot of families where there's no family history. This only helps if you already have a previously affected you know, child with MPS. And so there's lots of families who don't have any family history, and so therefore it's going to be more challenging. So in summary, since many aspects of clinical disease and MPS disorders are irreversible, improved outcome most likely will be obtained if treatment is started before onset of clinical disease. And that's sort of the message we've talked about for many years, but you heard it very strongly yesterday. Prevention, not correction of clinical disease should be the expected outcome. Routine clinical assessment still need to be done because ERT is not a cure, it's a treatment. And so there's still issues that need to happen and we need to identify these before they become severe and try to manage them. And clearly new treatment approaches are needed to improve outcome for central nervous system disease, skeletal joints, trachea, corneal clouding, and patients with high antibody levels. And these are the challenges for the future and certainly some of the MPS Society grants are approaching some of these problems but there's still lots of need uh, in this area. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Munzer. He pointed out he's a little late, but for him, this is on time. So, <laughs> our uh, next topic. <laughs> Our next topic is orthopedic updates in MPS, and we're pleased to have Dr. Clayne White with us. Many of us know Clayne well. He's a pediatric orthopedic surgeon and director of the Skeletal Health and Dysplasia Program at Seattle Children's Hospital and professor of orthopedic surgery at the University of Washington. He's an internationally recognized expert and advocate in the care of MPS and skeletal dysplasia. He serves as medical advisory board of the Little People of America as well as uh, the MPS Society's scientific advisory board. Uh, he's an MPS one dad and a former board of director member. We welcome Clayne White. Lower the microphone. Generally, I don't have to do this. <clears throat> okay, so we have our slides. Good morning. Um, it's a real honor to be here today. I've always enjoyed coming to this meeting. I thought last night's uh, breakout sessions were fantastic. Um, and so some of this, some of the families heard a little bit last night, but uh, a little more detail here. Um, and so, uh, the, and it's orthopedic updates, but the world of medicine moves pretty slow. So. You know, I, I hopefully I know there's a lot of new families here, so some a lot of this information will be new. But for if you've been here before, some of this is not so new. But I try to 
tweak it a little bit every year to make it a little bit, you know, to keep it interesting if I can. So like most of us here, we have uh, some disclosures. I do some clinical trials as well, uh, which is most of what I get for um, payments. So today I'd offer, and I've had this slide for a long time because it makes me laugh, but um, I am an orthopedic surgeon. I am not a geneticist. Um, and uh, we look at things a little bit differently than our medical colleagues. And so take what I say with a grain of salt. I also will offer an orthopedic perspective. This is Susanna, um, who was born in 1999, underwent stem cell transplant. Unfortunately, she succumbed to um, really transplant-related issues at age nine. Um, but uh, as we talked about in the dad's breakout session, she still is with us in our hearts and uh, we think about her every day. So she definitely has, has guided my, um, my career, I will say. So I'm gonna start with a little bit of what is orthopedics, really? What do we, how do we think about um, patients? Uh, again, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a different world as a, you know, cause, and to be clear, orthopedists and orthopedic surgeons are the same thing, okay? Are you, I often get the question, are you an orthopedist or are you an orthopedic surgeon? Well, I'm both. It's, um, and pediatric orthopedics is really the fun, the, the, where orthopedics started. Because if you think about the term orthopedics, it means straight child, it's Greek. And our job is, is to maintain, treat, and prevent musculoskeletal disorders in children. I don't have a medical colleague. I'm not, a, a heart surgeon has a cardiologist. A neurosurgeon has a neurologist. Orthopedic surgeons, uh, rheumatologists maybe, but they're really uh, doctors of inflammation and autoimmune disorders. So really not, we don't have a, um, a, 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 not a medical colleague, I will say. Um, and so really, as in, in pediatrics specifically though, we, we treat conditions of childhood. And so we deal a lot with deformities um, and a little bit less with joint disease. If you go to an adult joint surgeon, uh, orthopedic surgeon, they're gonna deal with sport, uh, sports disease of the knees or, their, or hip and knee replacements or, and so forth. So it's, again, it's a little bit different. And so what is our role? Our role is to maximize function and prevent disability. And, and how do we do that? Well, we prevent or correct deformity, we take care of fractures, we offer surgical and medical management of disorders. So we have, you know, there's a lot of organ systems and one that often gets forget about is the growth plate. This is the, this is the gro growth organ of long bones, okay? And it's, it's made of cartilage. And, and if you think about um, how this works, um, this is what we call the epiphysis. It sits at the end of every long bone. It's kind of the, you know, the rounded part of the bones. And then you have the shaft, the long, and so you, and this growth plate sits right at the ends of the bones. And you think about this epiphysis is sort of an asphalt truck that drives away from the center. And that's how our bones elongate and grow. And so um, it's, it's regulated through both endocrine pathways. So we talk about growth hormone, all right, that, that, that's sort of the major stimulus, but also estrogen and testosterone or, or circulating hormones. But there's a lot of biochemistry that goes, along, it goes around in these, in these growth plates. And so genetic disorders of bone are primarily um, defects in these, these small molecule, bio, uh, what we call paracrine pathways, um, and bio, local biochemistry. And so if we look at, um, MP, so here's again this, where the growth plate is in the end of the bone. And if we think about the MPS disorders, and, and when I say MPS, I'm also lumping in ML, so I apologize for that. Uh, it's not really specifically called out here. But um, as the <coughs> cells grow, um, they, 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 you have a resting germinal layer that then proliferates. They go through a series of, of growth and, and production of, of glycosaminoglycans specifically, and then eventually they get resorbed by the body and bone grows into Bye. the cartilage. So is that me? What is that? <laughs> I didn't burp or I didn't cough. Or so anyway, so this is, um, th this, is, this is the part of this growth center that, that results in, in, in disturbed growth patterns in MPS. Now it's not just long bones, we have similar growth plates in the spine. So you can get deformities of your long bones, but you can also get deformities of the spine, and I'll, I'll talk about that. 
So there's a term that you'll often hear bandied around, particularly in old textbooks, dysostosis multiplex. And this is another Greek term, it just means multiple bad bones, okay? And why it's specifically coined for MPS ML disorders, don't ask me, um, but it, that's, that's what you'll see. And it really, it's, as Dr. Munzer pointed out, MPS is really a diffuse problem. It, it's everywhere in the body. But um, it, we know that this is a, a problem with glycosaminoglycan, mediated inflammation. So we talk about storage disorders, but storage, the glycosamine glycans are very biologically active molecules. And so if you, it's not just like a space issue, it's, it's, a, it's a biology issue. And so this results in progressive deformity of the bones. And as, you, as you know, individuals with MPS get older, it results in degeneration of the joint. So arthritis of the, of the joints. So arthritis just means inflammation of the joints. Okay, but it, when we have inflammation, it's cartilage breakdown and pain and, and, and swelling. So I'll talk about all this. And this, uh, Lila Simonaro did some great work on this now a few years back, but I love this slide because if you look on, on this, um, uh, at, this, at the, the three bones here, the, the one on the left is, is, is an unaffected uh, a mouse. The one in the middle is um, is, is one that's been treated, and the one on the right is an MPS7 mouse. And so you can see there's this variation, and in, in if, if you treat the inflammation, you can have some attenuation of the bone disease in that middle slide. So, yes? Do you have a technical issue in the other row? Okay. The slide line row is on a different screen. For okay, you. I will stop. close, you would reshare real fast. Why did it happen to me and Dr. Munzer? I know, you're, they're funny. seeing his slides over there right now. Huh. Well, that won't help. There we go. <laughs> All right. Sorry? It was, yeah. This doesn't go against my time, by the way. Steve's going to pull out his little Bo Peep uh, shepherd's hook on me here. Um, okay. Sorry, but let's see where we're here. So, okay. So, talking, uh, hopefully, let someone let me know if they're not seeing this in the other room. Okay. So, deformity. Let's talk a little bit about deformity. So, we talk about, when, as orthopedic surgeons, we talk about deformity more or less in th there's three planes. It's, it's the frontal plane, so what we call the coronal plane deformity. There's the side plane, which I'll show you in a second, which we call sagittal plane. And then there's the, th the third plane, which is rotational disorders, okay? So in the coronal plane and the frontal plane, if we look at your arms or your legs, we talk about varus and valgus. So you'll hear orthopedic surgeons talk about varus. So varus is, is when the deformity points away from the midline. Valgus is when the deformity points towards the midline. So most of our MPS kids have valgus of the knees or knock knees. Um, you can also see some of the, uh, this in their elbows. If we're talking about the spine, this is scoliosis. So this is a coronal plane deformity for the most part, although there is a significant amount of rotation which is largely under, well, historically underappreciated. Um, and then so here's rotational and sagittal plane. So if we look at hip rotation. So if you're an in tower, most of the time it's because your hips are turning in. If you're an out tower, it's because your hips turning out. Sometimes you can see this rotational deformity in, below the knees and the tibias, specifically associated with knock knees. So you get external rotation of the tibias or external tibial torsion. Uh, sometimes you might hear that term. And then the sagittal plane, you can. Um, for M most MPS disorders, they have what we call a flexion contracture of the knees, so they walk, so kids or, or adults will walk with a bent knee gait. So, um, and, or, and in some, maybe if you have lax knees, maybe in Morchio, you might see Ray Curvatum where the knees back, where you back knee. And then if you look at the spine, the most common finding we're gonna find is kyphosis. And that's a forward, that's a forward bend in the spine. So you'll see all these examples. So this is just a little uh, ortho 101 for y'all. Um, and then joint disease is separate from deformity, and this is usually, this usually occurs later in life, as I pointed out earlier, and this is pain, swelling, and then eventually you get tightness and contracture, um, and in Morchio specifically, you have this joint laxity, so you can see this person's knee, which is doing a great party trick, which really shouldn't happen. The thing, this came up last night, and um, 
I think it's really important that when you see an orthopedic surgeon, as orthopedic surgeons, we like to make things straight. You know, we, we're, we're pseudo carpenters for the most part, and, but probably not as good. Um, and so you have to ask not what your surgeon can do to your child or to yourself as if you're an adult, but what they can do for you, okay? It, it, because it's, we can do a lot of things to people and make them different, but what we really need to do is make them better, all right? So you have to ask these questions when you're seeing your surgeon, really any physician for that matter. So will that intervention improve your function? Will it decrease your pain? And really in the end, will it improve your quality of life? So here's a nice little checklist for you um, if, if you'd like. Um, and there are many alternatives to surgery. And so surgery is, for the most part, except in some clear instances, is, is, is an alternative last resort. Um, joint pain um, and, 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 and you know, endurance loss, these can be made better with weight loss. So that's true for anyone, whether you have MPS or not. You can use assistive devices, they can be wheelchairs, they can be crutches. I love a lot of kids who have motorized scooters, um, orthotics, braces, you know, that sort of thing. And then pain relieving medications. And last night we even talked about getting, you know, getting into a hot tub, okay? Mm -hmm. Using some, you know, people use CBD oils and all kinds of stuff. It's, so the massage, there's many alternatives to surgery. And now, that, now they're not really gonna help deformity, but if you're having pain, a lot of these alternatives will work. So when do we operate? Well, when it's clear that the pain or the deformity that is present limits everyday activities. Um, and this can be pain, usually pain at rest, pain throughout the day, and certainly nighttime pain. Um, if you have limitation in your joint motion, that can be improved with surgery. Now that's not always true, but oftentimes it can, particularly say with joint replacements. Or we just know it's gonna get worse and it, we, we should intervene, intervene now. Now, there are, there are only a few things that I can say that truly about, that that's true. And you know, some discussion, again, I'm sorry I keep referencing last night, but there was a lot of question about hips in MPS1. And we just don't know the natural history very well. We have some sense and I'll share that with you. So this is just, you know, not to be memorized. This just shows that there's a lot of different orthopedic problems that you see in the different forms of MPS. So I'm going to kind of talk, go head to toe here, um, and we'll start with, with the neck. Um, so we call it, with cervical, so the word stenosis means narrowing, okay? So you can have narrowing of the spinal canal, and when that's up in the neck, that's particularly bad because that pinches the spinal cord at a level, which not only affects your arms and your legs, but also can affect respiratory function. Um, and narrowing can be either static, meaning that there's oftentimes a buildup of, of, of the bone. It's actually, it's probably what we call fibrocartilage, and it, and it pinches the spinal cord. And in some MPS disorders, or actually probably most MPS disorders, but more frequently say in MPS4, where you already have some joint laxity, you think about two rings overlapping each other, and if those rings move, that space between the rings becomes smaller, and that will pinch the spinal cord. So I lump these together, and you have sort of, sort of this Venn diagram of static and dynamic in, uh, narrowing of the canal. Um, and so you have the ligamentous and dural thickening that I mentioned. You can just have small bones, and then you have instability. And what happens is that pinches the spinal cord. And so this is an example of a child with MPS6, a two-year-old, who was just walking with his grandmother who took a fall backwards and bam, um, was paralyzed, but luckily it was temporary, we recovered for the most part. But what you can see here is um, there's this, the, 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 you see the ring of C1 sort of sitting forward on that left film, that's a CT scan, which is great for bone. And on the right side, you have an MRI, which is great for soft tissue. And you can see that little blush in the spinal cord there. And that, that is a bruise to the spinal cord. And this child ended up having to have a, a, a fusion to stabilize this. So the, a little bit unique to um, MPS is this dural thickening. Um, and like uh, Dr. Munzer's slide, you can see this, this storage um, accumulation in every type of cell in the body. And what you get oftentimes is this diffuse narrowing of the, of the uh, of the spinal canal. Um, and this is a, an adult woman with MPS1. Um, she was a school teacher and was starting to have problems you know, with balance and strength. 
um, and had to have a surgery. And this is a, a, a bit of a different issue because instead of just being at the top of the spinal cup, we'll call it so, um, the lanoaxial spine, this is subaxial, so the lower part of the cervical spine, and it's a very different treatment and much more difficult to treat. So what are the symptoms of spinal cord compression? Um, myelopathy is the medical term we use. This is a combination of weakness, clumsiness, an unsteady gait, and in when it's really severe and late, bowel or bladder incontinence. Um, some people with instability, their muscles will go into spasms, so they'll have some neck pain, maybe some posterior headaches. Um, so these are just things to watch out for. The surgery is, um, is a, this is just an example of what a fusion looks like um, with instrumentation. There's many different ways to do this. Um, uh, which is sort of beyond the scope of this discussion, but um, when do we operate? Well, certainly if there's a neurologic change, so if, you're, if you have signs of myelopathy or if you are certainly some kind of paralysis early, you know, from a fall, um, obvious instability on x-ray. So if the bones, we can, do, we can do dynamic x-rays and we can see those bones shifting, then we're probably gonna recommend a surgery. And as we, I showed in that child, MRI evidence of a spinal cord injury. All these are, these are very clear reasons to do a surgery. So moving down the spine, the gibbous deformity or thoracolumbar kyphosis, you can see in this child reaching over, you can see her, uh, her, her very classic gibbous. This is the most common spinal deformity in MPS, and in MPS1 is probably, and, and, and in Morchio, is probably the most common reason, uh, reason for diagnosis, um, certainly in an orthopedist office. Um, how do you treat this? Well, really, it's hard to treat, and, and oftentimes it doesn't need treatment, so um, I, I observe the vast majority of these. Um, but things we can do to help is maybe discourage unsupported sitting until a child is old enough to stand and really um, support the, their trunk. Um, we can brace them some, we can brace them, but it, it's, again, it's challenging. And we're not sure that it has a long-term benefit. But if we see a progressive deformity, then we often will try and brace it. The problem is the brace has to push on that bump, and then you get skin breakdown. It's really, it's really hard to do. And, and the truth again, as I mentioned, is smaller deformities don't get worse, and they don't need to be treated. So, but uh, we do try and delay as long as we can. The spine grows like every part of the body until, you know, a, in girls more or less age, you know, 14 or 15, and boys, you know, 16 or 17. And if we can, if we fuse the spine, then you limit growth of the spine. So we try and wait as long as we can. So in, in the absence of any neurologic problems or pain or, or disability, I will watch these for a very long time. So this is an example of a hurler child who has a deformity now I didn't do this surgery, I probably wouldn't have operated on this child, but this is a great example of how you do it the proper way when you do it. So, so you have to do a fusion in the front and the back to get good deformity correction, which means that you have to fuse in the front and the back. Now you can get to the front from the back. It used to be historically we'd do these incisions to go through the chest um, to get to these, but you don't really have to do that anymore. So as long as you can get a, a, balanced, a good balanced result, it doesn't really matter how you get there, just make sure you do it. So, and then afterwards, the kids will have to be braced because oftentimes the bones are small, the instrumentation is small, and you have to let things heal. Um, and this is just a, a paper which they tried to say that you could do posterior only approaches, but if you look at the the real data, you know, two of two of these had were, were had failed. Um, fusions because they only did posterior, and then there were two more who presented because their previous surgery had a failed posterior fusion. This is where, you know, the advertising, this is false advertising,